on the aging process on longevity. And I'm wondering, in your mutagenesis screens originally when you selected DAF2 to do a lot of your work, did you discover a number of other genes that have almost as profound an effect? And uh, if, they, if they didn't, then that makes more sense to me. If they did, it's surprising that several discrete genes, although they may all regulate transcription of many different proteins, um, would have such a large effect on longevity, perhaps twofold or threefold or so. Is this a bit of a master gene or not really? We've, we've done this experiment. We've now, what we've done is we've tested many of the genes in the, in the DNA for their effects on lifespan one by one using RNAi. We did what's called in scientific terms an RNAi genomic screen. Mm -hmm. And what we found was that um, a large fraction of the genes that we found that affected lifespan work with DAF2 in that hormone system to control lifespan. Another large number of genes seem to affect lifespan in a completely different way by affecting the, um, the mitochondria. And this is kind of a surprising result. We found that if you inhibit the process of um, respiration, process by which the mitochondria make energy for the body, the worms live longer. This, um, this system, so the mitochondrial effect on lifespan, it turns out that you have to turn down respiration during childhood to get an effect on, on lifespan. It's not the same as the hormone system, which only matters in the adult. Also we know that many of the genes that are involved or that are required for the long life of the DAF2 mutant are not required for the long life of the mitochondrial, ch mitochondrially challenged animals. So th that seems to be another major but separate system. In addition, if you, in, in many animals, live longer if you don't feed them as much. It's the process, something called caloric restriction. If, if you I don't know how true it is in humans, but for rats and many animals, including worms, if you restrict the calories, they live long. Well, it turns out that's also true in these little worms. But that process does happen in the adult, so it seems to be different from the, in other words, if you food restrict in the adult, the worms live long. So it doesn't seem to be the same as this mitochondrial system. And genes that are required for the hormone mutants to live long are not required for calorically restricted animals to live long. So that seems to be a third system. So in our big screen, a lot of the genes fell into the hormone class. A few of them fell into the caloric restriction path. And some fell into the mitochondrial path. And then there were just a few others. So I think that we're not just seeing the tip of the iceberg. I think we know a lot of, uh, we're seeing the chunk, the major chunk of the iceberg. So basically there are a few very important genes that control lifespan. In, I think there are a few systems. That each individual system, like right. the mitochondria, many genes act together right. for respiration, but there are, seem to be a, a limited number of major control systems. That are upstream of all those genes. There are just a few that are upstream, right? I think so, yeah. yeah. I think that's right. I don't think there are 50 such systems. But there could be another one that we missed. We didn't get every we didn't. We know that we didn't test every single gene. So we could have missed some, but not very many. I, don't, I doubt it. it would be very unlikely. Laura? Great. Wonderful talk. Just wonderful. Um, I was wondering about environmental triggers on gene expression. And I guess it was your, your guppy story that really made me think about that. So if you're in a harsh environment, you see one effect and, and you see something very different in a safe environment. So are there, for humans, <laughs> environments that might trigger these genes? Well, I'll tell you something that is so surprising and curious that we know about the worms and we don't know how true it would be for humans, but it's really surprising. It turns out that this hormone system in the worm is subject to control by the environment. And it turns out that the, that the things that matter to the worm are things that they smell or taste. If you take a, a laser and you kill the sensory neurons, the neurons like the neurons for the nose and the mouth that allow the worm to taste and smell things, they live longer. And if you, or, or you can take, a, you can use another technique and you can just simply knock out a gene that makes that allows you to smell one particular thing, an olfactory receptor gene. 
and those worms live longer. So it turns out that in order for them to live longer, they need to have an active, uh, well, I shouldn't say that, but that the reason that they're living long is because when you kill, sorry, when you damage the sensory apparatus, this uh, hormone system then is inhibited, which then allows the worms to live longer. So somehow, somehow the worms are sensitive to, to things they smell and taste. So you wonder, could this, it's so strange to begin with, but could it, it would be even stranger to think that human lifespan could ever be influenced by something we smell or taste. But I'll just tell you, if you're eating a meal, your um, insulin level goes up. But if you also smell the food, it goes up even more. So it's not completely out of the question, but we really are in the very early stages. Now, we don't even know if any other organism, if the, if the lifespan of any other organism changes depending on what it smells or, or tastes. So this could be something um, that's specific only to the worm. We don't know. Thank you. Um, well, first off, um, send away her driver because we're going to keep her here. You're not, we're not going to let you go. <laughs> so, it, it was a wonderfully elegant talk, Thank and I you. absolutely, uh, I mean, I learn more every time I listen to you. I really enjoyed Thank this. You. That's very sweet. Thank you. And, and, I, I, and I think this is a, a real important illustration of the importance of language. And in this particular case, throughout your, at least the first half of your talk, you were using the, the, the phrase, uh, aging is regulated. Aging is controlled, uh, as if there is a gene that's there, a set of genes designed specifically for the purpose of influencing how long we're capable, how long we live. And I think, and, and when you started out, you were talking about obvious genes that are associated with growth and development, reproduction, menopause, and it seems as though there's a metronome or a clock that's influencing these processes. And then of course, there can't be any question that there is a metronome for growth, development, reproduction, and I think that was classically illustrated. And I think, frankly, what it looks like to me is you have provided an elegant demonstration of why it is that we see differences in lifespan across species. Now, the real question is, is the aging process itself regulated? Now, there's a foundational principle in evolution biology suggesting that you cannot give rise to genes that are there specifically for the purpose of causing either aging or death expressed in the post-reproductive region of the lifespan because natural selection does not operate in that region of the lifespan. So that genes that would influence duration of life, and that's the phrase I would have preferred to have heard, genes that would be influencing duration of life influence something else, and aging is an inadvertent consequence of genes doing something else early in life. That's just one of many questions. Is that a question? A, yes. <laughs> the question is, how do you deal with the foundational principle in evolution biology suggesting there can't be aging or longevity genes? Well, there are two ways I think about it. First of all, I'm a molecular biologist, so what we, the things I told you about are completely independent, actually, of evolutionary theory. These are laboratory observations. But it is fun and interesting to try to reconcile it with evolutionary theory. But as I say, it stands alone because we change a gene, the animals live long. The gene controls a hormone, therefore hormones control aging. They act in the adult, therefore whether you want to say the hormones are controlling aging or whether you don't want to use those terminologies, the fact is the activities of the hormone in the adult are determining how long the worm lives and how rapidly it declines. So it's not really a semantic issue, it's, it's, it's reality, it's truth, it's what we see in the laboratory when we make these changes. Wait, I'm not finished though. <laughs> and um, um, where was I? Uh, okay, so however, it is interesting to think about how this module that does control lifespan in the adult or does influence lifespan clearly in the adult, how it could have come about. And I think I tried to explain why I think it could have arisen during evolution, not in any way to control aging necessarily, but instead to allow the worm to survive as a dower 
in harsh environmental conditions. That's a sufficient reason to explain how, why the system should have evolved. Once it's up and running, the animal can use it to do anything. And actually these guppies, which I love this study, these guppies um, were able to evolve very rapidly from one form to another. If you put predators in a pool, in just four years, they, they had, uh, let's see, they aged, they had fewer, let's see, they, they reproduced, they didn't have progeny so early. They, they, they then adopted the characteristics of, of guppies that had already been under these conditions. So in other words, they could evolve back and forth very, very rapidly. So if you have a regulatory system or a control system like this up and running, it, it, suppose there are two sets of guppies. One has the control system, one doesn't. The ones that do could potentially evolve faster because you could make big changes with small genetic changes, big changes in lifespan with small changes in genes. So that's one possible, that's one way I think about it. The other thing is, there is something else here. This um, hormone system does act in the adult after it acts to influence reproduction, which is a little earlier, in, that's when it acts in the adult to control aging. So it is acting after it, not after reproduction takes place, but after it acted to influence reproduction. So why, why does it act then? Well, one possibility is that what happens is that maybe it's good for the population for the animals not to have the post-reproductive animals not to live too long because if they do they'll compete with the the young ones for resources and even if they wouldn't if an individual worm wouldn't compete very much if it has any effect at all over time that will be amplified so it is possible that there is a selective advantage for the group or for the species to have a shorter lifespan so the, these worms reproduce, they're hermaphrodites, so each individual makes both sperm and oocytes in its own body. And that means that the progeny have exactly the same genes as the parent, exactly. So anything that's good for, anything that the parent can do to help the, um, the offspring will help the passage of the genes the, for that animal because the offspring are identical. So that is actually a possible reason why there might be actually some benefit to having a shorter lifespan. Dr. Hayflick, a question? Uh, yes. In your presentation, you used the terms aging and longevity. And I'm interested to try to understand whether you use those terms synonymously or whether they're, these are two separate phenomena. And regardless of the answer, I'd like your views on why they are identical or different. They, yes, I use them in a kind of um, informal fashion. I think of a, longevity as, or lifespan is how long the animal lives. The way I think of aging is the decline in the, in the, um, the integrity of the tissues and in the behavior of the animal with age. There's another way of defining aging, which is the chance of death at any particular time. Have you mortality, ever, right? And I'm not using it in that particular uh -huh. way. Have you ever, or your colleagues in this field, done an experiment in which whatever biomarkers you have chosen that identify the aging process, which in my view I think are questionable, but I'll grant that it's possible, have you, under those circumstances, intervened in a physiological system in these animals that, that stopped or reversed the process that you identify by whatever means and therefore showed intervention in an indisputable phenomenon of aging that you have are free to identify however you wish. Okay, here's what we've done. That's a, that's a great question. So we did an experiment in which we looked at the tissues of the animal using a high power microscope. And in young animals, the tissues are svelte, they're beautiful. And as the animals age, they begin to deteriorate. So what we did was we took pictures of animals, and also there's another thing, as you get older, people get older, you get what are called age spots. And those are, they contain a chemical called lipofusion. And these older worms also, in fact, not just worms, but I think maybe all or many species, as they age, they, they produce this pigment. So in older worms, this goes up, this pigment goes up. All right, so what we did is we, we took pictures of worms um, that were either normal worms or long-lived worms um, every few days. 
and we took the names off the pictures. We put the names, we hid them on the back of the pictures. And then we gave, we scrambled them up and we gave them to people, like four or five people in the lab who'd never seen them, and asked them to, to give them a score. So if they had really nice, perfect, young looking tissues, then we, um, they got a score of one. And if the tissues looked terrible, if we couldn't even believe the animal would still be alive, they got a score of five. And then we had scores in between. Sort of like if you're grading a, a multiple question essay test, you know? So we can't say that two is twice as bad as one, but you know, it was, it was along the line toward five. And then what we did is we asked, okay, are the, the do the long-lived worms, when they're, let's say, I don't know, three weeks old, do their tissues look most like a, a young worm or an old worm or so forth? And what we found was that, um, and, and that what we found was that the, the decline in the um, in the integrity of the tissues and the increase in the deterioration of the tissues happened at a slower pace in the long-lived worms than in the normal worms. And this was statistically significant. We did the same thing, very statistically significant, as you could imagine from the movie I showed you. And we also found the same kind of thing when we, um, let's see, uh, I just realized I'm going to miss my airplane. Hold on a minute. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I can't think here. Well, let's see. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, no, no. So, yes. Now, so, yes. So, they aged more slowly. Okay. They aged more slowly. Now, we have never found any mutant, any mutation, or any treatment that stops aging, that makes them immortal or it's certainly not anything that reverses it, which is really interesting. You might imagine that you could. That if, for example, if you turn up a bunch of repair genes, you might take all the damaged proteins and get rid of them and make brand new ones, and the worm could even look younger. We've never seen that. And not only our lab, but no other lab that I know of has ever seen anything like that. So we're not talking about immortality here. Well, I, I, I didn't know that it was possible to quantitate svelte cells or beautiful looking cells or even deterioration uh, to the extent that you can distinguish it from another possibility and that is pathology. Is it at all possible in your view that what you are seeing in respect to the alleged biomarkers of aging are in fact pathological process and not the aging process at all? Oh gosh, that's a very interesting question. It's a normal process. It happens in our worms that are under our laboratory conditions, that's what you see. Is it pathology? Are these worms? Is aging itself a disease? I don't know. That's. Well, you I don't know. Said that that's it wasn't earlier, or later. Well, I don't consider it to be. But you can. These questions then start to blur together. If you look at these old animals, they look like they have a systemic degeneration phenomenon that's affected all the tissues. You, well, the only thing so that I'd like to say is I, I, I admire your enthusiasm, but I, I have a great reluctance to accept your interpretation of, of good data. Uh, you know what? I have to say, I'm, I shouldn't say this because it's not, I don't mean this in a bad way, but <laughs> the fact that people like you say the things you do make me know I'm doing something important. <laughs> 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 right? Well, uh, because if everyone, I, if everyone already accepts everything you say, if they accept it all, then what's the well, point? Well, I think really? you misunderstand me. I'm flattered that, <laughs> I'm flattered that you made the, the, the statement that you did. But uh, I really would like you to consider the possibility, if you can widen your view to the extent that that's possible, to look at the possibility that you are dealing, that all of your beautiful data about which there is no argument can be interpreted in light of the fact that you have manipulated very nicely maintenance processes and the longevity determining processes and not the aging processes which are indirectly affected by those interventions. I will try. Dr. Dr. Whitehouse has some closing <laughs> notes and then we're going to. I, I just wanted to express my appreciation of your enthusiasm, particularly for a 90-year-old, as you identified <laughs> your age. <laughs> uh, you also have to realize that we were having some guy talk yesterday about cars. Uh, so when you started off saying uh, that aging is not like a car that just 
you know, falls apart. Uh, that, 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 that took on, a, a, you know, something close to our hearts, cars. I want to know, I've had three old Volvos in my family, and uh, they've lasted a long time. I think it has something to do with their Swedish genes, but I'm not sure. <laughs> At this point, I think we'd better get Dr. Kenyon underway. Thank you so much.